Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Alan Gould. I'm the executive director of the Drinko Academy here at Marshall. And on behalf of the Academy and the Marshall community, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this, the concluding event in this year's celebration of Constitution Week and the second annual presentation of a new series introduced last year named in honor of our late great United States Senator. It's entitled the Robert C. Byrd Forum on Civic Responsibility. In part, the inspiration for this series stems from a sad fact that Senator Byrd knew and labored to change. That's the appalling lack on the part of the American people of any clear understanding of their historical heritage, and especially in the writing of the most important document in our nation's history the Constitution of the United States. And, I might add, to the growing lack of civil discourse among our citizens in discussing the major issues facing America today. Sadly, issues are no longer civilly debatable. They are now partisanly confrontational, and it is sad. It was partly as a result of these conditions that Senator Byrd in 2004 introduced a provision in the United States law that designates September 17th, the date of the signing of the Constitution in 1787, as Constitution Day, so that Americans, especially our youth from kindergarten to college, would acquaint themselves with the text of the Constitution and study its importance. The Byrd Forum, however, is designated not only to fulfill the late Senator's call to better understand the Constitution, but equally to encourage the investigation of how people, as well as social and political institutions and forces, shape our understanding of the Constitution and the civic responsibility Americans have in maintaining the essence of our political and social systems. Senator Byrd's action inspired us here at Marshall <clears throat> to inaugurate our celebration of Constitution Week in September 2005 and to include in our celebration a forum on civic responsibility named in his honor. It is now my esteemed honor to introduce our distinguished speaker for this year's Byrd Forum. He's a gentleman I've had the sincere pleasure of introducing on several occasions. And actually, as you all know, he really needs no introduction. And he, everyone in this room knows who he is. And of course, that's Dr. Stephen J. Kopp, the president of Marshall University. Now, in my long career at Marshall, I have served under no less than seven presidents and another three interim ones. And none, in my estimation, have had a more profound effect upon this institution than President Kopp. Marshall has made tremendous progress since Dr. Kopp took office just a little over six years ago. For example, last fall, the university recorded its largest ever freshman class, and by all accounts, the freshman enrollment this year is expected to be even larger. Additionally, our president has overseen more than $200 million in new capital projects and major building renovations. Moreover, since 2005, Marshall has launched 11 new high-demand degree majors or programs, doubled its research grant funding, and the university's economic impact on the area has tripled to more than $1.5 billion. But perhaps above all, President Kopp understands that a democracy demands an intelligent electorate. And as the ancient philosopher the Greek philosopher Diogenes put it, the foundation of every state is in the education of its youth. Dr. Cobb has been a tireless advocate for the success of our students throughout this region. He regularly visits area high schools to instill in students the importance of not just attending college, but completing their degrees if they expect to compete successfully in the global marketplace. He is a champion of raising educational standards because he firmly believes our students are capable of achieving even greater results. So ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to present to you our president, Dr. Stephen J. Cobb. Thank you, 
Thank you for that kind introduction, Alan, and good afternoon, everyone. It is truly a pleasure to join with you today at this distinguished forum, which is only in its second year, to address the topics of civic responsibility and our understanding of the Constitution of the United States. In choosing the topic for today, I tried to choose a topic that would encompass both goals of this forum. I think it's important for everyone to realize that in choosing a topic like this, speakers are given a great deal of latitude to uh, develop um, the subject matter in ways that uh, tend to be somewhat provocative. The goal being to engage the audience in the issue at hand and to hopefully get you to start thinking about how the topic relates to not only the United States Constitution, but to your responsibilities as a civically engaged uh, member of our society. I see a number of students in the audience, and I certainly welcome you, as well as our faculty and staff. Um, of the students involved, Nikki down here gets an A for sitting in the front row. I don't know what class you're representing, Nikki, but if I'm in the grading, I'm giving you an A. Congratulations. The mention was already made of the significance of today's forum as it relates to the late Senator Robert C. Byrd. And for those of you who had the privilege to at least acquaint yourself with the Senator during his life, you know that he carried a pocket version of the Constitution with him everywhere he went. He was perhaps one of the most stalwart proponents and students of the Constitution, and certainly an exemplar of what civic engagement is all about and what our duties and responsibilities are as United States citizens. Much to the chagrin of Dr. Alan Gould, I have chosen to set the stage for today's address with a quote from Thomas Jefferson. which was taken from Jefferson's letter to Colonel Yates, Charles Yates, dated January 6th, 1816. In his letter he writes, if a nation expects to be ignorant and free, it expects what never was and never will be. If we are to guard against ignorance and remain free, it is the responsibility of every American to be informed. Take a moment to think about that statement because I think it is really the foundation of what civic responsibility is all about. And it is certainly a statement that sets the incumbent expectations that all of us should have for ourselves, our families, and people we know as we look at our responsibilities of not only citizenship, but what it means to be an active member in our communities and throughout our society. The founders of our fledgling nation keenly and astutely understood that education and an educated citizenry was the wellspring of freedom and the foundation for the success of the new republic. Yet despite this insightful understanding, the framers of the Constitution the Bill of Rights, and interestingly, subsequent amendments to the United States Constitution have consistently excluded education from the express powers granted to the United States federal government. The philosophy that social, governmental, and national interests are best served by an educated populace was first advanced in the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. In Article 3, there is a statement to this effect, and I quote, religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind, schools and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. Note that last word, encouraged. Nowhere in the ordinance and nowhere in the Constitution 
are the delegated authorities and powers of the federal government, do they include education? As noted, the Constitution of the United States is silent on the matter of education. And I truly do wonder how Chief Justice John Marshall's court would have ruled in a case if a case came before the court concerning federal versus states' rights in the matter over public education. This brief preamble serves as an introduction to the question we will address today, which has, as I said, both civic responsibility and constitutional implications. The question on the floor concerns the constitutionality of the federal government's role in education, especially public education, and the legislation that created the United States Department of Education as a cabinet level department. Let me provide some historical perspectives that undergird this discussion. The Constitution created a federal government of limited powers. As James Madison noted in his Federalist Papers, number 45, the powers delegated by the proposed Constitution to the federal government are few and defined. Those which are to remain in the state governments and the people are numerous and indefinite. Most of the federal government's delegated powers, the powers of Congress, are specifically set forth in Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution of the United States. No mention is made of education. The Tenth Amendment was appended to the Constitution to make it clear of the intent of the founders that the powers not delegated to the federal government are reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. Thomas Jefferson considered the Tenth Amendment the foundation of the Constitution because it preserved vast areas of life from national politics. For centuries, the United States was the only nation that did not have a federal ministry of education controlling and regulating public education. Arguably, the case can be made that it was one of the most unrecognized factors that contributed to the rise of our country's unprecedented mass secondary schooling movement, and it is also responsible for the concurrent development of an extensive and remarkably flexible and diverse system of higher education, public higher education in particular, which combined to produce unprecedented gains in educational attainment that were both steady and spectacular compared to the rest of the world. Unequivocal evidence exists demonstrating that an essential linkage exists between the formation of human capital, as reflected in high level educational attainment of a society, and the productivity of that society. The productivity gains that were made by the United States during the post-World War II era and the rise of prosperity thereafter between 1948 and 1975 were largely and inextricably linked to the gains that our society made in K-12 education and in higher education achievement. Economic gains are not the only reason to assert the importance of educational attainment. The ability of a democracy to function well depends on a high level of discerning political engagement, which is also tied to the educational level of the citizenry. A high level of educational attainment has been clearly shown to foster civic contributions of many kinds that benefit our society. These achievements during the late 19th and throughout most of the 20th century up to about 1980 were largely the product of local and state entities working on behalf of their citizens to fashion a remarkably heterogeneous public education enterprise in our nation. These public entities varied markedly, markedly from state to state, county to county before 1979, and certainly were not without their unevenness and faults. But as Milton Friedman once wrote, a society that puts equality ahead of freedom will end up with neither equality nor freedom. 
Think about this comment in light of the present despair over the state of public education in our nation today. Interestingly and unfortunately, the unprecedented record of rising educational attainment and progress in our, in our country began to wane about the time members of the 1951 birth cohort were graduating from college. That would be the mid to late 1970s. So what happened? What changed, especially from a pub public policy standpoint? The subsequent more than three decades stagnation in college educational attainment our, in our nation began to manifest at a time coincident with the rise of several unprecedented movements that have forever changed the landscape of public education, including public higher education. While association does not equal causation, it's enlightening to consider the possible relationships and interrelationships. I will only highlight one of these movements. The establishment of the United States Department of Education occurred in 1979. That may come as a surprise to some of you. Our students here were born and grew up during the time when the Department of Education was always a cabinet level department. This action was both highly controversial and opposed by many who regarded the department as unconstitutional, arguing that the Constitution does not expressly mention education among the powers delegated to the federal government. Many, even to this day, have deemed it an unnecessary and illegal federal bureaucratic intrusion into the affairs of local and state governments. As has been stated, the United States for centuries was the only nation that did not have a federal ministry of education, controlling and regulating education. That's not to say earlier attempts were not made by the federal government in the United States. A previous Department of Education was created in 1867, but it soon was demoted to an office a year later as an agency not represented in the President's Cabinet, it quickly became a relatively minor bureau in the Department of the Interior. In 1939, the bureau was transferred to the Federal Security Agency, where it was renamed the Office of Education. In 1953, the Federal Security Agency was upgraded to a cabinet-level status as the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. In 1965, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act was enacted on April 11th. It was passed as part of Lyndon Johnson, President Lyndon Johnson's War on Poverty and was at that time the most far-reaching federal legislation affecting education ever passed by Congress. But at that point in time, there was still no cabinet-level Department of Education. It was subsumed under the Joint Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. The Act is an extensive statute that funds primarily secondary and primary education, while explicitly in the legislation forbidding the establishment of a national curriculum. A very important point. As mentioned, in 1979, education was elevated to cabinet-level stat status by an act of Congress. Both the House and the Senate were Democratic, as was the President, a Democrat. The Department of Education Organization Act of 1979 states, the Congress declares that the establishment of a Department of Education is in the public interest, will promote the general wel welfare of the United States, will help ensure that education issues receive proper treatment at the federal level, and will enable the federal government to coordinate its education activities more effectively. And I want to highlight that last clause. Will enable the federal government to coordinate its education activities more effectively. Yet, it's interesting that Congress was affirmatively denied delegated power over education at the Constitutional Convention and in the Constitution. 
A compelling argument can be made that if there was any thought that Congress could utilize the General Welfare Clause of the Constitution as an open invitation to assume power, it was affirmly, affirmatively denied and negated by the principles ar articulated in the Ninth and Tenth Amendments. The Ninth Amendment states that the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. The Tenth Amendment provides that the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. The right to educate, one, to educate one's child is not specifically enumerated, yet according to the Tenth Amendment, it is reserved to the states and to the people. The right to a free public education is found in the various state constitutions, not in the Constitution of the United States. Every state has a provision in its Constitution, commonly referred to as the Education Clause, Education Article, that guarantees some form of free public education, usually through the 12th grade. The United States Constitution, on the other hand, contains no such guarantee. In a Supreme Court case, San Antonio Independent School District versus Rodriguez, the court held in 1973 that education is not a fundamental right under the United States Constitution. Thus, as a matter of constitutional law and as affirmed, the Founding Fathers left it to the states to decide whether to provide an education or not, and if deciding to provide one, to determine at what level of quality. Not only does the Constitution of the United States confer no delegated right or authority over education, it does not even explicitly empower the United States Con Congress to, to legislate on the subject. Now you might ask yourself, how could Congress pass legislation how could the President of the United States sign into law legislation that may, in fact, be unconstitutional? Well, one argument that could be given is that until the Supreme Court rules on the matter, it is neither constitutional nor unconstitutional. And according to my research, I have yet to find a case that has been brought before the United States Supreme Court where the court has ruled on the constitutionality of this matter. So it stands in abeyance, at least from a constitutional point of view. Most federal education legislation is therefore enacted under the spending clause of the Constitution, which gives Congress the authority to tax and spend for the general welfare. Since federal grants to the states may be conditioned upon the state's adoption of certain legal and regulatory structures, the federal government has been able to exercise substantial authority over K through 12 education policy and through the Higher Education Reauthorization Act, public higher education as well. As an example, the South Dakota versus Dole uh, case that came before the Supreme Court in 1987 upheld a federal law withholding a percentage of federal highway funds from any state that declined to raise its minimum drinking age to 21. This kind of carrot and stick approach underlies much of federal education law, from the setting of nation, national, nationwide achievement standards to the education of students with disabilities to Title I and other federal grants relating to education. It should be noted that the other great source of federal regulatory authority the Constitution's Commerce Clause, however, has not been used to enact federal legislation in, these, in this area. In the 1995 U.S. Supreme Court ruling in the United States versus Lopez, even the justices dissenting in Lopez agreed that the content of education was a classic area of state, not federal authority. My purpose today is to raise the question of where, whether or not the executive and legislative branches of the federal government acted constitutionally in assuming the rights and powers of the states and the people in the matter of education. 
it is clearly a matter for considerable debate and analysis. However, as civically responsible citizens, we can and should examine briefly whether this significant shift in regulatory authority has benefited our nation, and if, if it has or has not, at what cost. I will remind the members of the audience that one of the express purposes of the Department of Education Organization Act in 1979 was to enable the federal government to coordinate its education activities more effectively. Let's see how we've done. Statistics from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, an international organization, that is really the benchmark that most nations use to compare themselves as to how they're doing on the global uh, landscape, reveal that in 2006, the higher education attainment rate for 25 to 34-year-olds 34 34 in the United States was virtually identical to the cohort of 55 to 64-year-olds. Now, what does that mean? It means little or no gains have been made. And if you study the gains in higher education attainment levels, college attainment levels in our nation, we were going up every single year through the mid to late 1970s and have plateaued as a nation. Very little change in 30 years. I'll talk about the international rankings of the United States relative to other nations in a few minutes and the slippage that has occurred in the last 10 to 15 years is startling. With respect to the proportion of the college age population that earned degrees in the natural sciences and engineering, the global ranking of the United States in 1975 was that we were second ranked in the world as a nation. In two, the year 2000, we were ranked 17th in the world. The United States in the 1970s was the best educated country in the world. But in one generation, our educational attainment has held steady while other countries have continued to, to climb. The National Center for Education Statistics in the United States Department of Education publishes extensive data on education in its annual digest of educational statistics. The following important facts are from their latest report. Total federal spending on K through 12 public education has more than tripled since the 1970s. Average per student spending in public schools has more than doubled since 1970. Spending by level of government continues to rise. And you can see the breakdown in this table. Notice that local and state governments fund the vast majority of educational expenses in this nation. American spending on public K-12 education is an all-time high and still rising. The red bars show the trends, or at least the projections, through about year 2017. And we will pass the one trillion mark in about 2013. Yet interestingly enough, only 52% of the expenditures in education are spent on instruction. And that percentage continues to decline over time. Continuous governmental spending increases have not yielded commensurate improvements in American educational performance. And if you look at the performance on reading at the right, and you could see a similar graph with mathematics and performance going across the age continuum and across the time period from roughly 1970 through about 2005, very little improvement has occurred, yet spending has increased dramatically. However, increasing federal funding for public education has been accompanied by marked increases in federal regulation. And those of you involved in education can certainly cite examples of everything from the No Child Left Behind legislation to other legislation that's been enacted. Collectively, and just quickly examining these findings, which are based on more than three decades of data, 
The results certainly question the putative effectiveness of federal intervention into education and suggest that the experiment of federalizing the processes of education have failed to yield any improvements. And in fact, we could argue we're going the opposite direction. As compared to the other nations of the world, the United States appears to have stagnated with respect to college education attainment, the assumption being that college education attainment is a reflection of how K through 12 education is going. And that is despite outspending every single nation in the world with the exception of Switzerland. If you accept, as most people do, that college, excuse me, college attainment level of the population is widely regarded as an indicator of global competitiveness, we are losing the battle on global competitiveness. Go back to the other slide, Matt. If you look at Korea, which is well to the left, two, four, six, eight, the ninth country from the left, they're spending, in terms of K through 12 sp spending per student, roughly about $52,000 per student to educate them through K through 12. Uh, we're spending close to $93,000, $94,000. And yet, Korea is leading the world in terms of edu college education attainment. Go to the next slide. You can see where we were in data from 2007. Relative to every other nation in the world, Korea has jumped over uh, Canada in the most recent uh, 2009 data. Uh, they're up at 63% of their population uh, having earned college degree or above. We were at 12th in 2007. Where were we before? Here's a trend over about a, a decade. Third in 1998, 12th in 2007, and the most recent data, which is 2009, we've slipped to 16th. Overall, the relative stagnation in the percentage of Americans who've earned a college degree along with the declining global position of the United States suggests the need for a public policy overhaul irrespective of the constitutionality issue, beginning with reforms that re reduce bureaucracy, streamline regulations, and transfer greater authority over funding decisions to state and local governments. Perhaps the framers of the Constitution had it right when education was omitted from the express powers delegated to the federal government. The results of the experiment with federalized processes regulating education over the last three decades seem to affirm their insight and foresight. I ask each of you, as taxpayers and civically responsible citizens, to contemplate and delve into the burgeoning costs and the regulatory environment for public education, whether it's higher education or K through 12. And as you do, I offer the following assessment of the impact of the Spellings Commission report by Robert Zemsky, Professor of Education and Chairman of the Learning Alliance for edu Higher Education at the University of Pennsylvania. And I quote, among the myriad forces stifling innovation across higher education is the creation of an unprecedented and hence untried federal regulatory process that today helps discourage innovation by all but the most foolhardy. Instead of metrics for measuring educational quality, two quite different tasks, establishing a standard for determining how much graduates need to earn to say their education yielded gainful employment, and defining the credit hour have become the focus of the Department of Education's rulemaking. A regulatory environment has been put in place that provides the department with a broad role in determining what kinds of higher education are eligible for the federal government's $100 billion plus investment in student financial aid. What has emerged is not to be sure what was intended, but unfortunately, it is what we got. I began with a question, and I will close with one. Should Congress and the United States Department of Education be entrusted 
to regulate public education and public higher education? Or should that power be vested in the states as the framers of the Constitution seem to have intended? Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. I think the most surprising aspect of this, from my perspective, is there has not been a court challenge, a case brought before that found its way to the U.S. Supreme Court for a ruling on the constitutionality. Um, I think one of the arguments that can be made uh, about education is uh, the framers of the Constitution clearly understood how important education was to the United States and its development. At, the time of the signing of the Constitution shortly thereafter. And in the Northwest Ordinance, it's very interesting to look at it from the perspective of the original 13 colonies. And the major concern the original 13 colonies had was that a lawless society would develop on their western boundaries. And to ensure that did not occur, they felt education had to follow the westward migration, and it did. But in looking at what's happened in the last three plus decades, what we've seen is a transition from local and state, really regulatory authority over education, whether it's K through 12 or public higher education, to far more federal regulation compliance. And when you look at the fact that 52% of the expenditures in education are on instruction, that leaves an awful lot of money on the table that otherwise might have benefited students in the classroom. And so the question really is, is the federal government the right form of government to regulate education? Or do you know, local and state governments do a much better job of establishing the right parameters and the right context and the right situation to be able to produce the kind of educational outcomes that were produced up through the 1970s but have now tailed off? And I think, that, as I said earlier, the most surprising aspect of this, there has not been a court challenge about the constitutionality of the Department of Education being a federal agency. Yes? Were those numbers adjusted for inflation? Yes, those were constant dollars, 2007 dollars. Yes. So the whole point is we're spending a lot more money on education as a society. In, in fact, second only to Switzerland in the world in how much money we're spending to educate uh, students through K through 12. Those are, those are all K through 12 numbers. And current estimates are in 2011, it's, it's somewhere in the neighborhood, $111,000 per student is what's being spent on every student through K through 12 now to educate somebody uh, in the primary and secondary educational system. And yet we're not showing commensurate performance gains and outcome gains, if you look at college educational attainment, whether it's an associate degree or higher, we're just not seeing that manifest at the rate that is occurring in other countries. Simon? Um, I, I would say that that's a, that's a good question, but when you look at it in the context of through the 1970s, from a public policy point of view, mass education, especially primary and secondary mass education, was already part of the formula for education in our nation. We were not being selective about who was, was going. Now the question is, have we changed something since 1970s through 2011? Well, arguably, college going rates have increased. We have a lot more students going to college uh, than we had before. Uh, and uh, has that changed our, our performance? I think a better question or uh, area to look at would be, and I would like to look at this, is countries like Korea, uh, some of the European countries which are leapfrogging us, 
is this a reflection of our population growth and how our population is growing as compared to countries which may be showing virtually no population growth whatsoever. And we know the United States is continuing to grow in population. We have a large influx of people in, who are coming into the country who are not coming into the country college educated, who are in a sense maybe diluting some of the effects of our system. We don't, you know, that, that, that has not been parsed out in these analyses. But the part that disturbs me the most is how much we are spending compared to other nations in the world on education and just not seeing the results. And that's very problematic. Francis? Don't you think that you have to look at a cultural change that took place in education where we, instead of demanding certain levels of achievement and saying, no, this is not fun, it's work, you've got to work at this, uh, you have to spend more hours on it, putting demands on it. We've had a cultural change. Mm -hmm. Our children must have fun or they won't want to learn. Well, you know, when your child is at home, quite often they don't want to learn to do certain things. But you put pressure on them. You don't say, okay, honey, if you don't want to learn to be potty if you don't want to learn to use a fork, knife, and spoon, just don't do it. And then they go to school, and teachers are not getting to be as innovative. But I don't blame the federal government for that. I blame this cultural change uh, now, and uh, giving them a manual that says, you'll teach it this way. Well, I think perhaps one of the biggest shifts that's occurred that might align with the culture shift that you're describing is, if you go through the 1950s, 60s, and even through the mid-70s and throughout the decade of the 70s, parents were far more involved in the education of their children in the schools than they are today. And the question you have to ask is, what happened in that transition? Why aren't parents more involved and engaged? Well, in a lot of cases, you have now two parents working instead of one parent working. People don't have the time to invest in that. So I think there's a larger context of change here. Uh, it's cultural, but it has many roots and, and many seedlings that have contributed to this. Um, and the question really comes back to a very fundamental one. Just how important is education in the family and to what extent education is valued to the point where the children in that family unit understand the importance of education and are committed to it, borrowing from you, no matter how much work it takes. So, yes. I think what you were asking is what's the accessibility uh, aspects, and I haven't, you know, I'd have to look it up and give you the specific sightings uh, of what, how we compare. Um, if you're talking about private higher education, I think we're very, you know, high end on that, but on the public higher education side, with all of the support that's provided at the federal and local level, and especially state level, um, at this point, I don't think we're at that point where we're too far behind the other countries in terms of affordability. But one of the things that's very interesting to look at is if you compare the most, the children from the most affluent families and who have all of the uh, factors that you would identify as predictors of students who are gonna complete their college degree. A good example is uh, one or more, one or both of your parents having graduated from college. Take all that and look at it and take the top quartile of uh, 
children in that quartile, you still have a situation where one in three do not finish in six years their college education. Now, if you take that one step further and go to the most affluent, and picking the co cohort, family units that are making $158,000 or more annually and look at their performance, you still have one in five of those children who are not graduating from college in six years. Now the question's why. And I haven't seen any studies that compare decade to decade to see what's been happening in their performance level, but there are things that I think we need to be looking at in the higher education environment that can help reshape success for students when they come to college. There's no question about that. Um, but I think the other aspect of this is we need to find out what Korea's doing and some of the other countries around the world and ask if there are things that they're doing that would be advantageous for us to do in this country. Because Korea is really moving and setting the bar. South Korea, I should mention. Yes? Well, if you haven't had a chance, look up the, Re the Reauthorization Act for Higher Education and look at all of the regulatory requirements that were put into that act that didn't, act, didn't exist before. There's a cost associated with every regulation that's put into effect. The question is, do those regulations actually improve the effectiveness of education at any level? You know, whether you're looking at the uh, No Child Left Behind Act or you're looking at higher education reauthorization most important aspect of regulation, in my opinion, is that the regulations need to be aligned with what we're trying to accomplish. And they need to foster those outcomes. If they are not doing that, then you have to ask the question, why do we have the regulation? And so what's really cha changed in the last 30 years is the regulatory environment. And as the regulatory environment begins to influence accrediting bodies, regional accrediting bodies, for example, they begin to toe the line and everything's by the book. And suddenly you begin to develop a more and more rigid system that is intolerant of any innovation whatsoever. Because to act outside the lines, to try to do something innovatively, is discouraged because you might get cited or lose your accreditation. So there's a whole series of these sorts of events that have been happening over the last 30 years that, in my opinion, need to re be carefully examined and where regulations are not helping but actually hindering the results that we want to see, we need to either change them or do away with them and think about new regulations that are going to foster the kinds of outcomes and successes that we want to see in our nation and not ones that become whipping posts for organizations, states, institutions, or, or the like, and in fact become barriers to doing what we need to do. Maribeth? Well, but there's a difference between federal aid, which I would be a very strong champion for. I think the Pell Grant is an, an incredible piece of legislation, versus the regulations that are promulgated in conjunction with what it takes for a state or a university to comply with the requirements to receive that aid for your students. The more regulations that get put into effect, the costlier it is for the states to comply. Those are funds that never get to the level of the students for their benefit. And so the issue really is, I'm not asking the federal government to give it away with no strings attached. 
But be careful and be very selective on what strings you do attach. Because the bottom line is we want to see improved performance in terms of the outcomes that we want to see as a society. Society is willing to make that investment in our, in our young people, but we want to see the successes. And what we don't want to see is spending more and more every year in real dollars and see a stagnant system. That's not helping anybody. Yes. Well, the point I was trying to make with the pre-1979 lead-in was we had a system, to be perfectly honest about it, that seemed to be working exceptionally well. And when you look at the pre and then the post, what's happened over the last 30 years, there's been a sudden uh, halt to progress in terms of educational attainment. And when you begin to start looking at some of the seminal events that transpired in the 1970s, the changes that occurred, you have to ask the question, is there a connection here? Is there a relationship? It's not that there aren't federal systems out there that are working effectively. It's just we changed horses in the 1970s, and you got to ask the question, was that the right thing for this nation to do? Well, the implied powers may be the clause that would be used by the Supreme Court. My point, though, is until that's tested by the Supreme Court, we won't know what the ruling is. But I think there's enough antecedent history with the issue of education. It's not that the Founding Fathers didn't recognize the importance of education, as evidenced by the Northwest Ordinance. It's they deliberately, I would say, left it out of the powers of the federal government which by the Ninth and Tenth Amendments suggest that was intentional and it was to be left for the states and the people. Now, I'm not a constitutional lawyer, but I can tell you, when you see those sorts of patterns develop, you begin to realize that there was an expressed intent here that was not written down. If the Supreme Court were to take up the case and decide that it's part of the implied powers, it would take the whole issue off the table, but that court case has not seen light of day yet. So at this point, it's still a very important question, I think, that needs to be resolved. Yes? I'd like to throw out another thought for consideration. Um, we heard about the GI Bill, the thing about it, and then the discussion about why it's stimulating higher education. And of course, the advent of Twitter is actually very important for, especially for the sciences in terms of funding for, for education. One of the other things that corresponds with uh, the formation of the Department of Education was the end of the Cold War. And I think that our relaxation of concern with regard to funding for the sciences that came about at the same time could be playing into this. You may be right. You may be right. It's a good point. Yes. Thank you. 
Yeah, if I understand what you're saying is, is rather than meeting every other day or every third day, you meet every single day and complete courses along the way as you go. And, uh, um, you know, you could add to that a uh, uh, individualized or customized pacing. You know, if you happen to be a student that's very uh, adept or fluent in a particular uh, discipline area and you really get into it, uh, you go at your own pace and, you know, you know, accelerate through and so on. Um, and those are all very good questions. And I can tell you um, we are locked into a model that in large part is driven by federal financial aid policies. And so when you go right down to it, uh, you can experiment around the edges, but if you reform dramatically the whole, the whole system, then you go to a burden of proof uh, that what you're doing is comparable to what the federal government is used to seeing. So when I was talking before about innovation is for, the, uh, ultimately is for the most foolhardy, it, it really is those sorts of policy regulations that really drive what we, we can and cannot do. question is what federal regulations would be would eliminate the barriers to greater success therein lies That's a good question, and uh, I really haven't thought through all of the regulations to, you know, parse out some of the things that really look like they would be the most significant uh, obstructions to um, success on the part of students. I'd have to think about that for a while, but it's a very good question, and one we all ought to be grappling with. You know, we, we're all uh, dealing with this stuff at one level or another. Uh, and uh, it'd be very important to try to get an answer to that because I think people in Washington would like to hear that. I think one of the issues that happens when you look at incoming freshman class, uh, 30 percent or whatever, has to deal with remediation in some form or fashion. It automatically thrusts them into at least five or six years, if, if that. And we go back to the idea of. Other comments or questions? Well, again, I thank you all for your attention and for coming today. Um, all right, again, thank you all for coming. Before you leave, there's uh, one or two little things I'd like to do. First, uh, we have an award that we want to give to the president uh, as being a member of our forum. Um, and I will forgive him for uh, mentioning and quoting the name of Thomas, what's his name, uh, when he spoke today. Uh, I do like John Marshall a lot better, but President Kopp, on behalf of the Drinko Academy and Constitution Week, it is my pleasure to present you with a new award that we've just created for speakers at our uh, Bird Forum. Are you kissing up, Al? I'm trying my best. Well, thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. We created this award uh, just over the last year, and um, as you probably know, uh, we began the forum last year with our uh, speaker, a man named Dr. Simon Perry. And of course, we did not have the award to present to Simon, and knowing how easy it is to hurt his feelings, 
we decided to present Simon with one. Simon, will you come forward to get your award? His is bigger. <laughs> and lastly, there, we are having a reception uh, in which you have an opportunity to talk to your president, particularly students. It'd be a great time if you have a particular question you might like to ask the president of this great university. You'll have it. We're having a reception in the lobby of the Joan Edwards Theater. Thank you for coming and helping us have a great forum. <laughs>